Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, in this lecture, we are going to look at susceptibility to infectious disease or the evolution of disease resistance variation. Now, um, as I've mentioned, um, you know, variation, the greater amount of variation, the more likely the group is to survive or the species is to survive. Um, we are, we have the greatest amount of variation in our DNA as it relates to immune responses, more genes associated to immune response than any other um, parts of life. Hey, honey, you want to say hi? This is Gracie. Say hi, honey. <laughs> okay. So um, infectious diseases, there's a few different types of infectious diseases, a number of which I'm not going to discuss, um, but I do want to introduce you to two major types, um, bacteria and viruses. So infectious diseases are pathologies um, like bacteria, viruses, there's also parasites and prions and things like that, um, that are able to infect your body and then you are essentially the cause of the spread. So bacteria are living cells and we consider them to be living because they uh, self-replicate, they create their own food, their own energy. Etc. And they can survive on their own. So bacterial infections, um, you know, do not need a host. They can sit and kind of lay dormant until you touch something or eat something or whatever it is, um, and then are infected by it. Viruses are different. Viruses are not living. Um, they can only survive with a host. And the way that a virus works is it enters into your cell. It then shuts down your DNA essentially, and activates its own DNA or inserts genes from itself into your DNA so that your cell is then now kind of a viral producing machine. And um, the way that we have uh, responded to and dealt with bacteria and viruses is going to be dependent on how it is that they infect you. So paleopathologists, bioarchaeologists, this is another uh, uh, career within the field of biological anthropology that may be of interest to you. Um, some diseases leave distinctive marks on bone, which allows um, forensic anthropologists or uh, what we call paleopathologists or people who study ancient disease or bioarchaeologists who are archaeologists that are studying human remains. Um, they're able to see the cause of death or to study infections in disease uh, of disease in fossils. So just a few examples of what that looks like here. You can see that um, many infectious diseases attack the bone directly and they leave very distinctive marks of that infection. You can see these um, kind of large um, holes as a result of syphilis versus this kind of speckling-like effect that happens as a product of tuberculosis. And then leprosy, which is kind of just generally deteriorating the bones um, altogether. Um, so these are going to give some insight into cause of death. Um, they're also something that may be reflected upon when dealing with a modern issue. So if we want to understand how long tuberculosis has been around, um, what it looked like hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, comparatively to what it looks like now, because tuberculosis is a bacterial infection um, that is largely and very rapidly becoming resistant to antibiotics. So we want to kind of understand its evolution and its history as a public health concern so that we can use that information um, to potentially maybe predict where the disease is going to evolve from here and what we might do to control it in the future. So super cool um, job, cool career uh, that can relate to research. It can be something that you do in forensics. It can be something that you do in the area of public health, but fascinating nonetheless. So crowd diseases, um, the origin of pandemics, infectious diseases. So um, let me introduce you to three words here, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. I'm sure we're sick of hearing these words, right? Um, endemic is when an infectious disease is just kind of constantly in a population, but at low levels that doesn't really, you know, create any major risk. So the flu, you know, the regular old flu 
or cold or strep throat. Um, that is an endemic disease in the United States. It's kind of around, somebody always has it, but it's, it's not um, a public health concern. An epidemic is a public health concern. This is when an, an infectious disease is causing major risk to one particular nation or area of the world. When that expands beyond international boundaries and becomes a global issue, that's when we start to call it a pandemic. So COVID-19, of course, um, was the first pandemic we've had as a species since 1918. 1918 was the H1N1 influenza virus. That was the last national pandemic that was truly destructive. Now, what's interesting is that, um, you know, infectious diseases are, or what we call crowd diseases, are a relatively new phenomenon as a product of biocultural evolution and us being able to live long and have large populations and ultimately kind of end up in condensed sedentary environments. Um, infectious diseases thrive in those environments, but they didn't really exist or were not very common among small scale populations that were mobile because they're moving around, they're not spreading the infection as easily among small populations. And if the infection is dangerous enough, it's just gonna wipe out the entire foraging population instead of spreading. Um, or it's gonna wipe out the vast majority with a few people that may have some sort of immunity to it and they will then survive and pass that immunity on. So, you know, these, these concepts of infectious diseases, as we know them today, are a product of biocultural evolution. They became more and more common post-agricultural production um, due to increased sedentism or, or kind of living in the same uh, location for longer periods of time, which then ultimately causes population growth. Now, on top of that, agriculture also leads to massive famine and malnutrition because people exchange kind of a broad spectrum foraging diet where they're getting lots of different nutrients from a lot of places. They're exchanging that for just a couple crops that will grow effectively in that climate. And if a pest comes in or there's drought or something that wipes that crop out, you're basically fucked, right? You can't do anything until the next um, harvest season. So famine is incredibly common among agriculture, which means malnutrition, um, uh, poor sewage, uh, lack of clean water, all of those things are going to exacerbate the likelihood of getting and, and spreading infectious diseases, all our fault. Um, now, the earliest recorded pandemic was the plague of Athens that happened uh, between 430 and 426 BCE or before Common Era. That had a death toll of somewhere between 75 to 100 thousand people. And since then, there have been a total of 249 pandemics um, or global diseases that killed tens of thousands of people or more, sometimes hundreds of millions in the case of smallpox. So um, one thing to keep in mind in terms of public health and infectious disease um, for our species is that, um, that these diseases evolve as well. So this is kind of um, an evolutionary arms race, right? As our bodies get more resistant or better at fighting off a, a disease, the disease then needs to evolve to infect us more easily. And it's a constant race to see who's going to survive. Pathologies um, and microbes have developed all sorts of amazing ways to infect you and to spread themselves. So um, with smallpox, like you're seeing in this image here, um, legions on the skin from smallpox or chickenpox um, are symptoms that um, they kind of, once they burst, they can then spread um, the viral particles. Uh, and so it's causing the disease has evolved to cause the symptom of the pox, which can then open and spread among the population. Uh, salmonella is a form of bacteria um, that waits uh, to be eaten. So it sits on meats and dairy and things like that and just kind of hangs out until it gets consumed by a human being um, and can then infect you and then enter into the water supply or back into another um, uh, way that can then transmit between humans. Um, some microbes get free rides uh, like malaria uh, in the saliva of mosquitoes. This is a parasite. Um, and then you have something like influenza. Influenza is um, a virus as well. Uh, it's going to cause all sorts of lung symptoms um, and buildup of the viral particles in the lungs, which you will then cough out. Um, and then that will then send that viral agent um, airborne 
to um, another person. So, you know, the, the pathologies themselves have evolved to cause all sorts of symptoms to cause your body to infect other people. So then we, of course, have evolved adaptations to respond to this. Um, one of the things that our bodies do in response to microbes is to raise our body temperature. A fever is your body's way uh, to burn it out, essentially. Um, there, many microbes have a temperature threshold. And so what your body is doing with a fever is it's actually trying to surpass that threshold to kill off that particular microbe. Um, this is one reason why if you have a basic fever, you know, past 103, you're in dangerous territory. But prior to that, you know, try not to take any fever reducing medicines, because that's your body's way of dealing with an infectious disease. Another thing um, that we do is, of course, mobilize our immune system. Um, we have white blood cells, which create um, antibodies and antigens to fight specific diseases. And what's interesting, if I just go backwards here, if you look at the um, viral particle here, you'll notice that there's all these little um, um, kind of symbols on the top of it. These are what we call docking mechanisms and they have different names and they have different shapes and they come in different numbers and textures and things like that. And um, what the virus is looking for is kind of a matching docking mechanism. So they're going to get into your cell by um, docking literally like a spaceship um, onto the cell and entering using some matching version of one of these um, little guys on the outside. Now, what that means is for your immune system is it's going to then recognize that it's going to figure out how the virus gained access to the cell. Um, and it's going to create antigens, which will then likely destroy those docking mechanisms or the virus's ability to replicate somehow. Now, um, the I mentioned at the beginning of the, this lecture that infectious diseases um, and immune system responses are enormous um, in our species. Infectious diseases are major selective pressure and genes involved in immune response are the most numerous and diverse in the human genome, indicating the evolutionary advantages of a varied immunological response to a wide range of infectious pathogens. So we have evolved to have many, 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 many immune genes so that regardless of the type of disease, we can then um, have an immune response to it. Um, we have a couple examples of these here. One is the HLA gene series. Um, this is a gene series that's responsible for producing specific types of antigens. People that are heterogeneous um, for these HLA genes are less susceptible to certain diseases like HIV and hepatitis B, because these um, alleles, these um, HLA alleles may prevent those diseases from being able to dock into the cell. So we have a number of, of amazing evolutionary adaptations for infectious diseases. Um, another example uh, would be sickle cell anemia. Um, in, in, the, in another example of a selective uh, pressure in terms of our gene variation is sickle cell anemia. So people who are heterozygous for sickle cell anemia have a genetic resistance to malaria. Um, sickle cell alleles reduce the production of what's called a Duffy protein, and that prevents malaria from entering into the cells. Now, um, if you're homozygous for sickle cell anemia, then you get sickle cell anemia, which is a disease that you don't want. Um, it causes your blood cells to kind of cave under pressure, get clotted, and then you get stroke and, and you know, an unfortunate early demise. But a heterozygote can have the benefits of the sickle cell allele protection from malaria without actually having sickle cell anemia. So this is one of the many, many diseases that remains in our population because it actually has a selective advantage in its heterozygous form. Now, the reality is, um, you know, while we have all of these amazing adaptations for infectious diseases, a lot of infectious diseases, they're so simple. A virus may have six, seven, eight genes in it. So it can mutate and adapt very quickly, which means that there are tons and tons of diseases out there that our bodies simply cannot um, burn off or mobilize our immune systems quickly enough before that particular disease has already spread 
um, to an infectious level. And so we have as a species created cultural innovations. Infectious diseases used to be a selective pressure in our species the way that they were in all other animals on earth where many people you know, are going to die or many organisms in that species will die. Um, and that kind of keeps populations checked we kind of outsmarted that in terms of cultural innovations by creating um, things like antibiotics. So bacteria can be controlled with antibiotics, which essentially shuts down um, the, the bacterial cells ability to replicate. And this was an amazing innovation in the early 1900s, Time Magazine, you know, called penicillin, you know, this just this incredible, right, life-changing um, discovery. And, and it was, um, you know, keep in mind though, that ants were using that long before our leaf cutter ants, um, were using antibiotics to protect their fungus long before we were, but, um, that's the same place we get our antibiotics from, um, is extracting them essentially from bacteria. And, um, but the warnings were not heard of the, uh, discoverer of antibiotic, uh, the penicillin antibiotic or antibiotic resistance. Bacterial cells are living they evolve. And so as we started using antibiotics, they very rapidly stopped working. And that's because um, you flush the body with antibiotics, but some of those cells will be able to resist that antibiotic and they're gonna survive. And they are then going to replicate and perhaps be um, in the future, an antibiotic resistant version of that bacteria. We are seeing a lot of that. And in fact, bacterial infections are going to be one of the greatest risks to our species moving forward, um, because we are continually, you know, struggling to find ways to stop bacterial infections that don't allow them to evolve. We want to be careful. Make sure you take your antibiotics as prescribed. Finish them, um, because even though you feel better, there may be some remaining bacteria in there that needs to be killed off. And if you leave it, it's an increased likelihood that it will develop resistance. Um, be careful over washing, using antibacterial soaps. A lot of those things have been taken off of the market. One, because um, they're not necessarily all that effective. And two, because when they are effective, they actually contribute to antibiotic resistance as a whole. And so a lot of those have been just simply pulled from the commercial market. We want to be careful with that. Now, viruses cannot be controlled. Um, you cannot do anything once you have a virus. I mean, there are some things on the market that can, can that can reduce the likelihood of the viral replicating, but a lot of them have, um, you know, are are not useful for people who are immune compromised or, um, you know, many scenarios they can't be used. Um, and so instead for viruses, we as a species have developed what are called vaccinations. Um, and what a vaccination does is it acts very much like your immune system. Um, you're going to get a, um, a version, a, a very micro amount of that particular disease in any number of forms. It can be um, killed, it can be dead, um, it can be live, but essentially shut down so it has no replicable ability, um, or you can get the antibodies or antigens just kind of directly injected. And um, because it's such a micro amount, uh, it gives your system, your immune system, the opportunity to then discover it in the body, uh, learn about it, right? Develop the proper antigens to kill it and then get rid of it. Um, and so right after a vaccine, you're usually going to have maybe a little bit of a fever or some sort of immune response because your body is learning about that particular disease. The benefit though, is that um, now your body has the antigens and the, you know, the, the, the blueprint essentially for the antigens that are needed to kill that particular virus before it can spread. So when you actually come in contact with that virus, like the measles, your body's already prepared and it can mobilize quicker. So if you have a vaccine, you can still get measles, you can still get COVID, but you're less likely to die from it. Your symptoms are going to be significantly more mild. Um, and that's exactly actually what has happened with um, COVID-19 over the past few years and with measles in general. Now, vaccines are extremely important um, and extremely effective. You can see here um, the process of what we call herd immunity. So um, notice in our top image here that a couple infected people are going to wipe out the large majority of this population. 
Here we have a few immunized people, which means that the death toll is a little bit lower, but still very high. Um, in the bottom image, most of the population is immunized and we've reached what is called herd immunity. And herd immunity means that enough people in the population are vaccinated against the disease that it's unlikely the disease will even enter the population or will be able to spread to those who are not vaccinated. And by those who are not vaccinated, I'm not talking about people who choose not to vaccinate, which is a whole other level of privilege, but people who cannot vaccinate, people who have autoimmune disorders, people who have cancer, pregnant women, children of certain ages, uh, the elderly, people who have um, who are immune compromised to, to some extent, people who have allergies. There are reasons why people are unable to get vaccinated and herd immunity is supposed to protect them. Now, anti-vaccination is a whole other thing. That is a, a white privilege thing where, you know, people who are wealthy and who can take their kids to the hospital if they do get measles, have the privilege to choose not to vaccinate based on a whole host of misinformation. Um, this is very important to me um, as a science. So I do like to clarify, um, you know, and take questions about this in my in-person class. Um, you know, a few reasons people don't vaccinate um, include things like uh, that they is correlated with autism. Please know that there's absolutely no correlation between vaccine, uh, vaccines and autism. There was a single study, which was a fraudulent study by a doctor named Andrew Wakefield. Um, that study was um, removed. Uh, it was unpublished. Uh, he lost his medical license for, uh, for creating fraudulent data and no single study, independent study or the like has ever shown a correlation between autism and vaccines. So number one, that, that's out of the equation. Um, two, people do die from getting vaccines occasionally um, and they die because they are immune compromised, because they are allergic, um, because they are already sick. You're not supposed to get a vaccination when you're already sick your immune system's already mobilized, it may not be able to mobilize quick enough. Um, and so the, the effect of that may be that you get very sick from the disease you currently have. Um, and so, you know, you hear occasional stories of somebody that may die from a vaccine, which then leads to fear and people choosing not to get them. Keep in mind that comparatively, the number of people that vaccines will save is absolutely enormous. Um, hundreds of millions of people died of smallpox and smallpox basically doesn't exist anymore as a result of the vaccine. So <clears throat> we have to kind of cost benefit analysis here and keep in mind if we head back to our molecular biology section that we are working towards individualized pharmaceuticals and vaccines where we can use your stem cells to determine which version of the vaccine is going to be healthy for you so that we can reduce death from vaccine to absolutely zero. So we are on our path to doing that. Um, there may be some other explanations why people don't vaccinate as well, religious reasons, that's gonna be the hardest to counteract, for instance. Um, but do share with me if you have any concerns because vaccinations are absolutely crucial to the survival of our species, especially moving forward, um, as this will not be the last pandemic that we are a part of. Um, and that is because our, our existence, culturally speaking, is always going to exacerbate diseases um, in a wide variety of ways. So um, world trade, travel, I mean, just literally getting on a plane and traveling to another location. Most diseases have an incubation period. It's how Ebola got to the United States a few years ago from West Africa. You know, it's how COVID got here, arguably, um, from East Asia. Um, and so these uh, just general um, traveling, world trade, all of that is going to cause diseases to spread very rapidly. Um, we also live very close to our animals that we love, both the animals we've kind of live in our homes, domesticated animals, and then animals that we consume, um, their, their, their byproducts or their meats. Um, those animals, the longer we live with them, will be able to evolve and infect us. These are called zoonotic diseases. Um, the flu comes from birds and pigs, for instance. HIV is a disease that was once, um, that is called SIV, evolved from chimpanzees in Central Africa. So the longer we're around, other animals, um, the more likely that those diseases will be able to transfer to us. Okay, hiccups every time. So what else might be causing culturally, you know, culturally might be causing infectious diseases to spread? There's a lot of things. Antibiotic resistance, anti-vaccination movements um, are going to be huge um, 
in terms of um, expanding the spread of particular diseases, but lifestyle, um, poverty, you know, people who are forced to live in slum-like conditions, um, you know, with, with poor sewage or no sewage, um, cultures that have, you know, unique funeral practices where they're around the, the corpse for longer than, um, you know, the average American would be, um, or, you know, funeral practices that, that don't get rid of the body before the body becomes infectious. Lots and lots and lots of things can cause infectious diseases to spread. Um, and the result of that is, is, um, uh, also that sometimes diseases we've conquered to some extent can come back. Um, and so measles is an example of this. In, in 2017, there were still 110,000 deaths from measles, but know that vaccinations for measles, the MMR vaccine um, declined measles deaths by 80% between 2000 and 2017. And that 92% of all newly reported measles deaths are unvaccinated individuals in the US, right? So not even globally, but in a, the wealthiest nation, one of the wealthiest nations in the world is where the large majority of measles deaths happen to people who are unvaccinated. Now, this is not people who necessarily choose to be unvaccinated, but those who are vulnerable and are unable to vaccinate and then are, are infected by somebody who chooses not to vaccinate. LA had a huge outbreak a few years ago of measles, Disneyland got shut down um, because it is largely a white middle class, upper middle class thing to do to avoid the measles vaccination in California these days. And as a product of that, a number of these children were then bringing measles to Disneyland, infecting uh, other families and children who maybe were too young or people who were immune compromised. Those are the individuals that die. Um, and that's where I, this comes in. And I say that this is about privilege, um, that remember that when you choose not to vaccinate, that is a privilege um, that you have as a wealthy person and you are putting other people's lives at risk who don't have that privilege. Um, so, you know, the anti-vaccination movements are almost directly responsible for the rise in measles deaths in this country and around the world. Tuberculosis, um, 1.6 million deaths in 2017, um, and 82% of those were drug resistant. 82% of, of uh, tuberculosis infections were multi-drug resistant, meaning that tuberculosis is gradually becoming almost exclusively resistant to every known antibacteria, um, antibacterial or antibiotic on the market. Um, this is a danger. This is one of the biggest public health concerns um, for our future is being able to curb um, antibiotic and drug resistant diseases. Malaria has also developed drug resistant. Um, there were uh, 435,000 deaths in 2019 um, with 219 million people infected. And at any one time, over 3 billion people are within range of getting malaria. Now, what's interesting about malaria, it's a parasite, that there are many reasons why it's proliferating. One is drug resistance. Anti-malarial drugs are causing drug-resistant malaria. Climate change, droughts, flooding, things like that are now creating more stagnant water areas, increasing the likelihood of mosquitoes and thus mosquito uh, transmitted illnesses. Then we have pesticide use. Um, the strongest pesticide on the market, DDT, the most one of the most dangerous things in the entire world, um, has now caused um, malaria to evolve and mosquitoes to evolve to be incredibly powerful and resistant of even the most toxic substances on the planet, meaning we have almost nothing left to use against. Now, um, in the area of of uh, mosquito illnesses. Um, we have amazing genetic engineering. Um, we have all sorts of experiments out there where we are genetically engineering mosquitoes to essentially, um, you know, kill off malarial infected mosquitoes or to prevent the reproduction of um, infected mosquitoes. Um, we have many viral options that we looked at actually in previous modules. When it comes to antibiotic resistance, um, we are also looking a little bit into genetic engineering. So remember early on in the semester, I said genetic engineering is gonna be crucial to our survival. This is another example of where that's going to come into play. So I thought I would share this example, how a long forgotten virus could help us solve antibiotic resistance. Take a moment, pause the lecture and watch this um, fascinating TED talk on genetic engineering that may in fact help us cure antibiotic resistance globally.
it's incredibly fascinating, right? The things that we can do with our technology. Now, remember that this means that we have to get funding for this type of genetic engineering and also means that people have to understand how it works um, and what it means to use and engineer a virus compared to what a virus looks like that infects your body um, and kind of the many benefits and things that we can do with this type of technology. Um, it's certainly going to save a lot of lives. And so I hope that you found that uh, fascinating as well. Now, this is all I have for you in the area of infectious disease. In the next section, we're going to look at the human life cycle. We're going to see why, you know, some uh, children are born more or less developed, um, why children grow and reach puberty at different rates, why we are different in terms of male and female, what those differences are, what that means. We're going to look at sex as non-binary. Um, and then we'll look at old age. Why do we die? Um, you know, why do we get cancer? Why do some of us live longer? You know, we're going to look at the human variation in the, the human life cycle. So if you have any questions about infectious disease, vaccines especially, um, or any of the genetic engineering technology that I, I shared here, please let me know. Um, I have lots and lots of resources for you. Um, use the general forum, reach out to me via email, or if I have office hours uh, this semester, please come to those. Otherwise, I will see you for the next and last lecture set.